So um, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Just one bit of clarification why, why I'm here. I, I work in the international unit of GD competition um, and we are responsible for basically for all contacts of the European Commission with countries outside the EU. So, and we are very much involved in the enlargement process. Um, uh, and my, among my responsibilities are um, enlargement in the area of competition policy in the Western Balkans. Not Croatia, because that's finished, but it, notably Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, and so on. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to skip and be as brief as possible. But uh, the curse of being last on the program is that a lot of your points have already been made by others. Um, and Mr. the ambassador mentioned this before, so I'll try to be brief. Basically, um, when moving towards uh, EU membership, the basic test is that the member state, the potential mem member state, must must be able to um, uh, assume the responsibilities of, of, of EU membership. Um, and the process for the world of Western Balkans was also mentioned yesterday by the ambassador. The basic, basics are, are, are included in the, in, in the stabilization and association agreements. Um, there's a trade part there and a competition, and a competition part. Uh, and the starting point is that um, the potential candidate country should have an EU-compatible uh, competition law, <coughs> including uh, rules on concerted practices and unilateral conduct. Uh, it should have an operationally independent competition authority, and it must, must apply across the economy. Uh, there are also state aid rules. I'm not, I shall not go into that, but we take state aid control very, very seriously um, within the European and also for the candidate countries. Um, I'll try also be brief here um, concerning convergence. Um, EU bureaucrats like me, we talk all the time about alignment with the acquis. Acquis is French, it means more or less that which has been, uh, which has been accomplished. Um, and, but it's actually EU jargon for what I call hard convergence. If you, want to e if you want to join the EU, there are a number of conditions that you have to fulfill. So the convergence is not only on substance and modus operandi, operandi but also on legal, procedural, and organizational frameworks. Uh, but the dilemma here is that, I mean, informed convergence, that we impose something uh, onto the candidate countries, and they realize why they have to do this and why it is important, but that's not always the case. Um, so it must not become forced convergence or purely form-based convergence. With purely form-based convergence, I mean that the candidate country set up, I mean, they, they apply the law, and they set up the authority, maybe, and, and then, but there is no real intention behind <laughs> to really, to really um, uh, take this seriously. So, so um, um, this is a, a balancing act for us. Uh, the, con the convergence must allow, also must allow flexibility and, and be adapted to country-specific circumstances. One size does not fit all. Um, this is, uh, so the startup, startup package is not enough, and I think Mr. Kovacis has, has mentioned that, um, um, how difficult it is to get going, and it's, I say it's a never-ending learning process, but by um, cooperating uh, and by um, uh, taking part of the experience of other um, um, uh, 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 authorities and, and, and regimes, that hopefully the learning curve becomes steeper. Um, also, a couple of brief words um, about uh, competition poly. It does not exist in a, in a vacuum. It's one, albeit very important, are many tools to make markets work better, um, but uh, it should also in interact with other policies, um, such as market opening, i.e. liberalization, sector-specific regulation, public procurement, consumer policy, industrial policy, trade policy, and even bankruptcy policy uh, is, is a way of, 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 of um, aiming to make markets work more efficiently. Um, so now I move on to the part which is pitfalls and challenges for, for emerging uh, competition regimes in the Western Balkans but also elsewhere. And I start with the legislation and, and, and sometimes we see examples of cut and paste uh, without reflection or adaptation. Uh, I've seen one example, for instance, um, we looked at a new draft law 
and we saw the merger thresholds, and they seemed a bit high, so we asked them why. Uh, well, we copied the, the thresholds in the creation law. Uh, and this was a country that was much, much, much smaller and had a completely different economy. Uh, and, and um, I mean, uh, when we said, sorry, sorry, you have to make some kind of, 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 uh, of uh, assessment before you set the murder thresholds. Um, some rules may also be oversimplified and mis misinterpreted. Um, uh, for instance, the definition of market dominance, market power. Um, and I'm, I mentioned unfortunate court judgment from the Court of Justice before, but that's not enough. In certain laws here, um, that it's included in the law, um, a per se assumption about market dominance. A company that has more than 40% market share is assumed to be dominant. Uh, and that is clearly not in line with the key. Um, so that is something that we um, criticize. Uh, another thing is, um, and that Mr. Kovacic also touched upon, uh, is actually consulting stakeholders before legislating. And that should be a proper consultation. I mean, we shouldn't just write the law and then say we have, we have to consult, but we know what to think. Well, uh, so proper consultation, it delays things, but it's in our own interest of the lawmaker because it, it adds transparency in the policy making. Uh, the outcome is better legislation, fewer inconsistencies. Um, it increases stakeholder acceptance um, and it increases public awareness of this. So it's, it's, it's actually very, very, a very bad idea and a missed opportunity not to do this. And then there's always a but, and on the other hand, um, you shouldn't sit, sit down and, and think and think and think and plan uh, all the time, because I mean, it's, it's impossible to, get, uh, to find the 100% perfect competition law. There is not, no such law anywhere. So get it adopted and start working. Minor flaws can always be fine-tuned later, because uh, legislation can be amended. Now I move on to the competition authority, um, how it should be organized. Basically, there are two ways, basic ways of, of, of um, organizing a, a competition authority. Either you have a sector-based um, um, organization, you specialize dep uh, depending on sectors, or you can have an instrument base. You could have a separate unit for a unit or department for merger control, um, antitrust cartels, and so on. Uh, there are also hybrid systems or matrix systems. Some of you might have seen the organogram of DD competition. Um, that is, it must be one of the most advanced in the world because it's sector-based, instrument-based, and it's hybrid and matrix. It also explains the fact why it's absolutely impossible to understand. But we think it works quite well. Um, I'm not sure it's, it's a good example to follow, though. Um, another problem with competition authorities when you start up is, it's like Mr. Kovacic said, administrative capacity. Uh, usually, the, uh, the agencies are understaffed, and there's a lack of good and experienced managers. Um, uh, also, I hope, I'm, I'm glad that there are a few students here. I hope they have not all left, because it's also important to have academia. You, can have, you have to have students starting to specialize in competition law. Um, the authority has to have investigative and analytical capacity. We always talk about law, we talk about economics, but something that is often forgotten is to have basic knowledge in procedural law. Um, and there have been tremendous problems in certain countries. In Serbia, I think nine decisions have been struck down on purely uh, procedural grounds. And then we go and talk to them, maybe you have a systemic issue here. And they're also we're trying to, I mean, we're trying to pass, pass on the message that you really, really, really have to get stronger on the procedural issues. Uh, now they have a new president of the competition authority who is an experienced judge. So hopefully things will get better. Um, the importance of priority setting in project management, I shall not go into that. It's been touched upon. Um, the independency and the quality in the decision making is important. That is also something that we look at at the European Commission. Uh, unfortunately, I don't read Serbia, serbo croat but we get the, the decisions translated and we look at the quality of the reasoning. Um, and also, if you've been around for a while, it's quite easy to spot if, if there's been some kind of political interference. Uh, you can read between the lines. Um, and that is one of the things that we monitor in, in the EU, because the, the, 
the um, authorities of the country need to build up a, a credible uh, enforcement record. Um, these are also things, I mean, you should do strategic planning, that that's, uh, goes without saying. Um, you should be proactive instead of reacting. These are sort of mantras that you hear all the time. Uh, sometimes tactical planning is, is, is forgotten. Um, you have to be flexible and adapt to change. Um, and also if you have pursued a case for quite a long time and then market, market circumstances change, uh, you just, sometimes you just have to stop the case. And there is something that I call case team capture. You're in the case team and you have worked on the case for three years and one day, one after, an afternoon, you realize this doesn't stick and we have to stop it. It's not a nice feeling, but it has to be done. Um, no.